بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم حضورنا الكريم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أرحب بكم في منتدى المرأة العالمي في دبي في البداية اسمحوا لي أن أعرف عن نفسي أنا ديالة علي وإنه لمن دواعي سروري أن أكون معكم في هذا الحدث الذي يعد إحدى أكبر التجمعات الدولية الهادفة إلى دعم وتمكين المرأة واستعراض أبرز إنجازاتها والذي يعقد للمرة الأولى في المنطقة هنا في دبي السلام عليكم Welcome ladies and gentlemen My name is Khalid Al-Amri And I am delighted to welcome you all to the world's largest gathering aimed at promoting women's achievements and advancing women's participation in the UAE Over the next two days we're going to be joined by 2,000 leaders and thinkers who are going to be debating the role of innovation in advancing women's participation across all sectors. We're going to be discussing issues such as female participation, gender diversity, and women's contribution to society. To bring these ideas to life, we need creativity, we need leadership, and we need breakthrough innovation. The UAE is a shining example of incorporating creativity as a source of socio-economic progress, empowerment, and hope for the region. So it's without further ado that we welcome Ms. Clara Gimard. Sayyidati wa sadati, walan ma al kalima tarhibiya min Clara Gimard, raisat muntada al mar'a lil iqtisadi wal mujtama, falta tafadal mashkura. Your Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Maktoum UAE Vice President, Prime Minister, Minister and Ruler of Dubai, and Dubai. أصحاب السعادة الضيوف الكرام السيدات والسادة إنه لشرف لي أن أتواجد هنا بينكم اليوم معنا مدار إثنى عشر حتى اليوم has been giving to women and to men the opportunity to learn, to share, and to build a future. The Women's Forum is unique in the world. With our pioneer spirit, our will to make a difference, and the invigorating atmosphere at every Women's Forum meeting all around the world. But I cannot be keen without thanking the woman who embodies with passion and dedication the Women's Forum. Let me thank Jacqueline Franjou. <laughs> Rounds of applause for Jacqueline. <laughs> and uh, the CEO of the Women's Forum of the, for Economy and Society and the whole Women Forum's team. Rounds of applause for all the Women's Forum team. And please allow me to express my deep gratitude to Her Excellency Mona Al-Mari, <laughs> Shamsa Saleh, and the Dubai Women's Establishment. <laughs> this historic gathering, the first ever Women's Forum event in the region, could not have happened without the dedication and the commitment of the Dubai Women's Establishment. Thank you again. I want also to like, to like to thank the great speaker that we have with us today, Her Majesty Queen Rania Al Abdullah, Her Highness Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed Al Nayan, Her Excellency President Amena Gurib Fakim. Her Excellency Sheikha Lubna Al Kasimi, Her Excellency Rem Al Hashimi, Her Excellency Sayed Al Tayer, and a woman who comes from France but is now a global leader, uh, the chairwoman of the IMF, Christine Lagarde. 
and many other very distinguished leaders. So the Women's Forum is not about what, how the world sees the woman. It's really about the way the women see the world. It's the voice of the woman, it's the thought of the woman, it's the soul of the woman, it is the intelligence of the woman bringing to the world. Today and tomorrow here in Dubai, we will have the best, the finest minds and the finest leaders and they will come and we will discuss together about the future of the world and how we can in in innovate better. Let me especially welcome the Scandinavia delegation. And welcome also all the men and women who came over from Europe, from the Americas, from Middle East, North Africa, South Africa, Asia. I know that Dubai is used to have the whole globe here in your country, but today it is in this room. Um, where, whatever we are from, let us think global here today in Dubai and feel that Dubai is our home to be leaders, to be mothers, and to be wives. Just as men are to be leaders, to be fathers, and to be husbands, we have here to come to talk, to listen, to learn, to innovate. Let us feel confident. Take your time to network. Take your time to knowledge and experience. Those two days are yours. Our voice matters. We know for sure that healthy, educated, and empowered women are the very core of a better society for all of us. This economy is giving us, this new economy is giving us opportunities to create business, to start business, and that can really change our life at work and at home. And we can also be focused on what we can do for the future of our globe. We want all to work in a more efficient working environment. We also all want a more balanced life. Who don't dream about that? Each of us do. Yes, we are different. Women and men are different. But we have to be sure that, yes, we keep this difference, but we don't go in stereotype. No, all the girls are not shy and sweet. They can be fighters. Not all the men play football and want to fight. We all are different. This is the diversity of who we are. We are a community of people and today here we'll try to go across those stereotypes and really understand what women and men together can bring to the world. This gathering is a sounding board, a testing bench, a providing ground. Use it to grow and to inspire your colleague, your families and your friend. As Simone de Beauvoir, a French philosopher used to say, change your life today. Don't gamble on the future. Act now without delay. This is what we are going to do during those two days. I'm truly honored to welcome you for this very first Global Women's Forum in Dubai. Let's innovate. Thank you. نشكر السيدة كلارا جيمارد رئيس منتدى المرأة للاقتصاد والمجتمع والآن يسعدني أن أرحب بكم في الجلسة الأولى لمنتدى المرأة العالمي دبي تحت عنوان 
نقطة تحول حيث سيحرص المتحدثون من خلالها على منح منتدانا اليوم افتتاحية مفعمة بالإلهام رحبوا معي من شبكة CNN بالإعلامية ومقدمة البرامج بيكي أندرسون Thank you, Ms. Clara Gemart, President of Women's Forum for the Economy and Society. I'm delighted to welcome you to our first session, The Turning Point, where our speakers will provide an inspirational opening for Global Women's Forum Dubai. In welcoming Becky Anderson, Managing Editor and Anchor of CNN, who will be moderating this panel session. Welcome. <laughs> A very good morning to you all, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honour to be moderating this opening session of the Global Women's Forum in Dubai in 2016. For the past two years, it's been an absolute privilege to call the UAE my home. So I'm Becky Anderson, I'm Managing Editor of uh, CNN in Abu Dhabi. I'm the host of Connect the World with me, Becky Anderson, um, broadcast nightly from our programming hub in Abu Dhabi. And so I join the local delegates amongst you all in welcoming our guests from all over the world to what should be two days of incredible exploration uh, into innovative ideas and practices to sustain um, and benefit women, society and the global economy. So, as our opening speaker suggested, let's innovate and to do that, please join me this morning for this plenary session, uh, the turning point, uh, welcoming to the stage um, Her, Her Excellency Amina Gurib Fakim, who is the President of the Republic of Mauritius. Put your hands together, please, for our first guest onto the stage. Her Excellency Reem Al Hashmi, who is a Minister of State here in the UAE, appointed recently as Minister of State for International Cooperation. Good morning. Commissioner Margaret Vestager, who is the European Commissioner for Competition at the European Union. And our final panelist this morning is Emma Bonino, who is a former member of parliament in Italy, well versed and well experienced in being a woman in politics. Thank you very much indeed. Reem, as we kick off this women's forum in Dubai, a first for the Middle East, of course, which is remarkable. I wonder if you just take a moment to reflect on the milestones that have led the UAE as a nation to where it is now. We will discuss our personal milestones, those who may have mentored us, our turning points as we move through this next hour. An audience, I would love for you to participate in this as well. There are microphones around, so, so please do get involved as we move through. But Reem, I thought perhaps we'd just start with the milestones for this nation. Thank you to everybody present here today and particularly to the esteemed panelists. Hi. The United Arab Emirates didn't only start in 1971 as a federation. I believe and I know that the story of the UAE started decades and perhaps even centuries before where this place was a cultural and a trade entrepot for routes, trade routes, maritime routes, from all around the world, but in particular between the East and the West. But as we established the Federation in 71 under the leadership of His Highness Sheikh Zayed, the founder, and His Highness Sheikh Rashid and the other uh, ruling members of the UAE Federation, it was the beginning of a more, if you will, established journey of nation building. And in many ways, a lot of the men and women present in this audience, but also uh, beyond, their personal journey, their professional journey has mirrored that of this country, because it is a, a young country. And it has always been 
part of our core belief and principle that we would build a place that would be open to others, that would respect people's differences, their religious diversity, their cultural diversity, and that it would be uh, truly a beacon of aspiration and hope. As we established the nation in terms of the hard infrastructure, the attention then diverted to softer elements, which are actually, soft is a misnomer in many ways, because it's actually the durable elements of education and healthcare. Now you see innovation and you see scientific exploration as part of the overall agenda. And in many ways, this journey has taken people's aspirations and hopes in a region that is yearning for this type of hope and also ambition. Mm. The involvement of women in this journey is a core integral um, component of its success. Women are not part of this because it looks nice. <laughs> women are part of this because we need the women. <laughs> And the fact that there's recognition from the very top, not just recognition, conviction from the very top that we are partners in building this nation to or towards a future that we, we want to be promising and exciting for the future generation is truly not only inspiring, but it's a, it's a true privilege, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it also reconciles the debate of do you have... Islam and modernity work hand in hand. Arab tradition and culture and internationalism works hand in hand. There isn't that sense of conflict. The fact that we have more than 200 nationalities that live in this country, mm -hmm. that live and celebrate their differences and that diversity is also testimony to this country's journey. And, and I'm sure if you ask others in the audience, who have seen this country grow and who've grown with it, whose aspirations have grown and whose own ambitions have grown with it too. There's the sense of we're all in it together because we're all united by an overall vision and goal. And, and really the leadership of His Highness Sheikh Khalifa, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, Sheikh mm. Fatima, mm. the uh, mother of, of the UAE, are all core integral elements of how we could take this story forward. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking for many reasons towards 2020 because we have a, a world exposition in 2020, <laughs> but we also turn 50 as a nation in 2020, 2021, which is going to be the eve of our golden jubilee. So just think, what has been done in 50 years by, by the United Arab Emirates, by the people who live here, by the nationals and the non-nationals? And that, I think, creates a very compelling story of hope and of aspiration. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. As we kickstart these two days, I just thought that would be the opportunity to really sort of place us in the UAE and get us going. So let's talk about our turning points. Um, you were talking about the privilege that you feel in playing a part in, in the, the evolving nature that is the nation of the UAE. I remember my mum once saying to me, being a woman is a privilege in and of itself. Imagine the alternative, she said. That was when my, I felt sorry for my dad. She used to say on a regular basis as we were sitting at, at, at lunch and at supper. But I think it was Eleanor Roosevelt who famously once said, we all create the person we become by our choices as we go through life. In a real sense, by the time that we are adults, we are the sum of the choices that we have made. What were your choices and watershed moments, Amina? Uh, thank you, Becky. Uh, well, first of all, I think I'd like to say what a privilege it is to be addressing this uh, amazing forum mm -hmm. here in Dubai. And as uh, Her Excellency has said, we are here looking at uh, diversity. We are here to celebrate all these uh, you know, various nationalities who, who are here in Dubai celebrating women today, celebrating women's achievement. You've mentioned a, a very important uh, point, uh, is turning point. I hail from uh, the academic world, and uh, I am, I can safely say, at my third life, uh, because prior to becoming in this political position, I was an entrepreneur. And 
I can safely say now that uh, my turning point has been from the moment I chose, and you mentioned choices, mm -hmm. the moment I chose to leave the academic world to become an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And uh, this for me has been a turning point in as much as uh, I had lost, left behind my comfort zone, comfort zone of a prepaid salary because the budget is voted well in advance in the public sector, the comfort zone of doing things in a certain way, which has become a way of habit. And I decided to leave all this and uh, go alone and to start my own business. Mm -hmm. Now, why this is a very important step uh, as far as a woman is concerned in a small country like Mauritius, being highly insular, and also hailing from a, a Muslim background, because I'm Muslim by faith, and so all this was taking a very big risk. Mm. And uh, in terrorizing the, the notion of having to take risk when you take, become an entrepreneur is something women have to take on board up front. And mm. no business school in this world will teach you how to take risk. Now, why it's important uh, for, uh, uh, as a model, as a symbol to women is that I put Mauritius in the, the, the political framework, in the political background of Africa. Africa, we are going to have 11 million graduates every year, out of which, of course, 52% will be women. And uh, the whole idea of uh, empowering these youth with entrepreneurial skills, especially in the science, technology, innovation, agriculture, because also science and technology, is so important. Because my narrative has been all along is that whenever you're talking about the difference between the North and the South, it's the fracture of science, technology and innovation. It's transformational. And uh, where Africa has been lagging behind and Mauritius has been lagging behind is that we constitute this 12% of humanity that only produces 1% or less mm. of the knowledge in this world. And if we are going to address the youth of today, mm. they have to go in the science, technology, innovation. They have to become entrepreneur. So what are you doing in Mauritius to foster risk takers, to covet risk takers. I mean, we talk about youth. I'm going to remind you that I reckon that most of this audience is under the age of 30 today. Mm. We may be the oldest around, in fact. So <laughs> there are, you, you are talking to a very, very good audience yes, here when we yes. talk about what the challenges will be going forward. And I'm fascinated to hear you saying that it was the risks that you took that were your turning points yes. in life. Before I move on, just what needs to be done to better provide an infrastructure for those who want to take risks, particularly women, but let's talk about society as a whole. Yeah. Well, let's transpose a youth in the United States, because we have mm. very much the reference of the United States. A young lady, or a young man for that matter, after finishing university, PhD, <coughs> That person can choose to go in the Silicon Valley. They'll have the philanthropist, they'll have venture capital, they'll have angel funding. Mm -hmm. They have the entire enabling environment to actually help that youth along. I mean, we've seen the emergence of Facebook, Google, they have all been university projects. Mm -hmm. But when you come from a developing world, these projects very often they end up in the valley of death mm -hmm. because there is no enabling environment. Narrative I'm hearing all the various political leaders on the continent, they're always saying, we would like the diaspora to come back to roost. But why would they come back until and unless we create that enabling environment and to accompany this youth, this young lady, this young man? Mm -hmm. And this is where some emerging countries have been so able to do. So to be able to take risks, the youth can do it, but the youth must have this enabling environment mm -hmm. to be able to, to do, mm -hmm. to come up with his or her idea. And come along with the product at the end of the day. Thank you. Emma, what sort of risks did you take? <laughs> what were your watershed moments? Huh? Oh. It's all right. <laughs> you can... <laughs> Far uh, away. <laughs> Mamma mia. What the... <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, no, for me, the, the, the turning point in my life uh, uh, was a personal problem. I was 27, I had already a university degree, I was already working, I was already earning my living, 
But nevertheless, I discovered that I didn't have the choice uh, or to, uh, on my personal life. Uh, I was in Italy, of course, back in the 70s. And uh, family planning had been just very recently legalized, and it was not spread, was not uh, practiced in some way, it was new. Uh, abortion was illegal, uh, turning in uh, widespread uh, uh, clandestine abortion with all the health risk and so on and so mm. forth. And I bumped in this, uh, in this problem and I simply said this is totally unfair. Mm. That is unacceptable. So I started campaigning, then we, uh, uh, with I discovered, by the way, that it was not my only, my personal problem. It was hundreds of thousands of Italian women who were undergoing the same problem. Mm. So we started uh, getting organized and uh, with a lot of non-violent initiatives, uh, civil disobedience, uh, going to jail, etc., um, mm. etc. Cetera, et cetera. Even, uh, uh, well, in a Catholic country, as you can imagine, um, the Pope is really next door to me, meaning <laughs> next door. <laughs> uh, but in any case, now the new Pope is much better, you much more inclusive, other, much <laughs> more... To no, no, let me tell you, I'm, I'm totally secular. <laughs> I am a non-believer, uh, or I believe in the human rights uh, basic <laughs> principle, which is already quite enough. Um, uh, but but uh, in any case, we got the law on family planning, we got the law on legalizing abortion mm. and etc. And since then, whatever has been my life dealing with international trade, very funny, international <laughs> trade or fishery, yeah. or life is really bizarre. Uh, um, in any case, um, the, I never, never forgot to have women on my radar mm. and on my priority. Why? Hmm? Why? <laughs> but, no, I think, first of all, because I'm a woman and I, I'm sorry, but I cannot forget it. Huh? <laughs> so, um, secondly, because rationally speaking, I, I strongly believe that uh, to not to use 50% of the energy innovation uh, of the population is uh, just a waste. Yes. I don't pretend that it's enough to be woman to be better. Mm -hmm. Woman, uh, anyhow. But, but, but also <laughs> men should not pretend that just because they are men, they are better. <laughs> but they do. <laughs> they do pretend that they just... In Italy they do, anyway. So, <laughs> not to offend anybody so, here. You know. <laughs> uh, and third, because I, I strongly believe that just because we have been out of power for so many hundreds of years, maybe we have something fresh to say, mm. something different to say. I'm not pretending uh, a more effective, but let us try. I mean, the, the world is in such a bad shape to run by men that it seems <laughs> difficult for me that we will do worst. So, <laughs> well, so, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe, um, mm -hmm. and you know, and the other thing is that, frankly, yeah, to be, to be respected, to be mm. accepted in the political life, mm. which is the one that I know better, mm. uh, you have to be twice as prepared and three times mm. more eloquent and prepared than men. In any case, don't worry, it's not so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so, you just try and uh, you will succeed. That G, that multi-skilling <laughs> gene, well done, Emma. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so, 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 a clear uh, delineation in your life as to when you, you were taking risks and where your, where your success has come from, Margaret. Well, I think one of, one of the very good reasons to, to come here is to find the inspiration and the courage to do something about the mess that we're living in. Because you're absolutely right, the world is in a very, very bad state. And, um, and for me, I was, I was raised in, in the western part of Denmark, it's a very rural area, uh, very Protestant, very hard work ethics. And I was, uh, at a time, uh, the political leader of the party that I come from, it's a small party, 
it was doing very bad. And uh, everyone was asking me, well, are you the right leader? And, um, and then I took a day in my office, and all of a sudden I realized that I could walk away, mm. that I didn't have to stay. And then I was free to choose to stay, mm. to make it an active choice. This is what I want to do. Mm. I don't have to. It's not because it's expected of me. Mm -hmm. It's not because uh, it would make a mess if I left. I can leave. Mm. And that very fundamental freedom, I can do something else. I can have a very simple living. Uh, maybe I can even do gardening. That would be challenging, but I could. <laughs> then I could, uh, that changed it completely for me. Do you remember that? I mean, that's a very conscious yes. memory for you, is it? I remember it because I have tried to make my office somewhat more personal, so I had some, I thought, beautiful carpets. Mm. And I still have this picture of the carpets that I could basically roll them mm. together, put them on my shoulder, <laughs> and say, this is mm. it. I'm out of here. The beauty and the colors, I take that with Are me. Are you saying that... You that, that, that kind of inherent memory now is one you take with you because you know that you, that, that will sort of inform everything that you do, that you still know that you can stop, you can move away, you can, that, that you continue to have this conscious choice that you are making. Yes, because one of the things is that I, I have huge difficulties in saying no. <laughs> um, and I never really sort of planned anything because I think if you plan too much, you become one of those horses with their blinds on, mm. and you don't realize that the most interesting things may be here oh. or there. Mm. Um, and when things happen out here, then you have to be able to be much more flexible in your mind to accept what is coming to you and say yes. Reem, you talked, thank you, um, you talked about the milestones that this great nation of the UAE is has achieved. And I know uh, as a minister here, you are regularly set targets and priorities and milestones, but they are milestones, they are not things that you, that, they are not goals, because I believe that a milestone is something you achieve and then you move on, right? And goals are things that you achieve and you kind of leave behind. What were your clear watershed moments in what has been a very prolific <laughs> professional life to date? I think, Becky, the professional and the personal life tend to intertwine. Mm. At the end of the day, we are whole people, men and women alike. And with the work that we do, you see one seeping into the other. Mm. Your professional life steeps into your personal and vice versa. I mean, to Margaret's point, this moment of realization that I have the power mm. to choose my own destiny and frame mm. it in a way that makes sense for me and for what's important to me it might sound simple, but it's a, it becomes an epiphany when mm. it comes to you. And it comes uh, at a very powerful rate. And I can actually relate to that as well in many ways. When I was posted in Washington for a few years after 9-11, those were challenging times because there was a series of uh, evolutionary understandings of both the Middle East and Islam and certainly of the United Arab Emirates. And I think there have been several moments where I could look back and say, for example, the IRENA campaign, the International Renewable Energy Agency mm. campaign, which I was part of, mm. where we were trying to tell our story as the United Arab Emirates, as a hydrocarbon producer, that we believed in renewable energy. <laughs> and we believed it and we felt we were better suited to host it than Germany <laughs> and than Austria. And telling that story in the subcontinent, in Africa, and in Asia, and in Central America, mm. and in the Caribbean, and mm. all around the world, and introducing the Emirates to them, and realizing that in many ways we're so similar. Mm. I promise you, a mm. woman in St. Vincent and Grenadines, mm. and a woman in Samoa, and a woman mm. in Mauritius, and a woman in the heart of the Al Ain Desert, mm. probably has very similar priorities, mm. very similar concerns. And that oneness almost <coughs> exemplifies, or at least was reiterated in the Dubai Expo 2020 story. Mm. <coughs> and I think trying to talk about 
what you believe in and why you believe in it and hope that people start believing in it too. It's a mm. campaign of sorts, like Emma said, mm. but this one was an international one because we were not very well known mm. and we had tough competition around us and we had a story that didn't fit your typical stereotype mm. of what the Arab world or what the Muslim world typically entailed. Mm. And so I think in that journey and in those many thousands of conversations, thousands of interviews, um, I also discovered myself. I also took a moment because you can't, if, if, you're, if you're serious about the work that you do, you have to, it's not an act that you play, mm. it's something that you are, that you believe in, mm. that you're convinced of. That's the only way you will convince mm. the other. It's the only way, you can't underestimate the intelligence mm. of your interlocutor or of, of your counterpart because mm. they too have had thousands of meetings and thousands of conversations, so mm. they can spot a, a phony, <laughs> right? So you, you have to actually, you have to mm. walk the walk Mm. You have to believe in what you're saying. And so you also almost have to have that moment where you're thinking, does this matter to me? Is it important to me? Mm. What do I want out of all of this? And why is it taking so much out of me too? <laughs> and those types of conversations that you have with yourself are almost reflected and mirrored in how hard you fight for your own country's agenda. That's fascinating. Um, and, and great, uh, great advice uh, to those who are in the audience here. Well done. I mean, to all of you, thank you. I, so some, some great ideas about where our watershed moments, turning points, milestones might have been. I'm often asked um, whether I've had role models. Um, and, and I think role models are incredibly important as um, we begin to progress through our sort of personal and professional lives. I've never had a personal mentor myself, but I've always aspired to strong female champions. Um, Award-winning foreign correspondent Martha Gellhorn was always a, uh, an inspiration for me. Her, her work was prolific, but it was her, it was her compelling, compassionate reporting uh, back in the Spanish Civil War uh, that I most love. And she once said, and I just want to quote you uh, one thing here, the thing about war is that it has two sides. The, ver the first is the absolute horror of it. The other thing about it is that you meet absolutely marvelous people, brave and extraordinary people. This was in war reporting. So as I say, you know, a, a champion for me, a female champion for me would have been Martha Gellhorn just because of her integrity and her balancing what she did, but her uh, humility and, 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 her, and her personability. Did, did you have mentors or role models? And do you think for women, for the men here as well, that, that, that role models are important? Um, thank you, Becky. Um, I think so. Mm. I think uh, role modeling, uh, especially in the field of science, who had been operating, uh, if you look at statistics, they're not exactly fantastic for women in science. Uh, having the role model is it's, it's very important. But I think I'll just pick on what uh, uh, Reem has said, mm. is that uh, if you are going to be a role model, I think that role model must also have a vision, must show mm. integrity, and must be true. Because, uh, as she has already said, she used a very important word. Youth can easily, and everybody can detect a phony. And if you want to stay uh, on, on the run, for uh, to be a role model is very important. For me, one of the uh, fantastic role models has been, and I keep saying that, Marie Curie. Mm -hmm. If you think of the time that she operated in the 1900, got two Nobel Prizes, and was denied an academic post, and still managed to make a dent in the sciences. Mm. I mean, to me, that's a fantastic role model. Um, so to come back to, again, the issue of where we are in Africa, uh, we need to have very much these role models in mm. all areas. Now, if you look at the field of agriculture, which will feed the continent, which feeds the continent as we speak, you know, it's the women. It's the women out there. And when we look at challenges that climate change will impact, for example, it's the women who will be, of course, disenfranchised again. Mm. So we need to empower them. We need to bring them out. We need to show that they are the one there. And as Emma has said, mm. they're doing a great job. And they should be proud of it. Emma, you will be a role model for many people. Did you have role I'm models? I'm so old. 
<laughs> not that, not that, not true. I'm old anyhow. But, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you are. Not all yet, about... they're old and modern. <laughs> Did you have mentors, and, and are they important as you, as you p pursued your own career? Well, my first role mother was my mother. Mm. She taught me how to negotiate without looking to it. In the sense that I discovered later on that in fact the, the real strong person in my family was my mother, but she never challenged publicly or in front of us children the authority of my father. Mm. She never challenged it, let's say, in front of us. But one way or another, uh, maybe a few days later, you discover that I wanted to go to, the, uni to, to the, the university. My father said, no, 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 that's not for girls. Uh, your, your brother will go, it's not, the university is not for you. Um, and a few days later, a few weeks later, after every night at dinner, I would say, I want to go to the university. He would say, no, no, no. I would say, yes, yes, yes. And, but weeks later, my father began to blink. Mm. And I discovered that it was not only me, it was my mother every mm. night, every day, every mm. night. So finally he gave up. <laughs> uh, and I went to the university. So she taught me how to be, how to endure, mm. how to compromise, how to accept not to challenge the authority publicly when needed, mm. how there are many ways in which you can mm. move forward. Mm. And then, publicly speaking, uh, my role model has been, and it is yet still, Aung San Suu Kyi, because of her non-violent endurance. Mm. And uh, promoting women's rights and etc. is not an event, it's a process. Mm. It needs time, it needs, how do you say, consistency, mm -hmm. It needs, it's not one day, it's one life. Mm. So, my two role models, so different, but so important Aung for Sang me. Aung San Suu and mum, you were clearly learning to innovate for sustainable, uh, for a sustainable life going forward, <laughs> even with your, with your mum and your dad in the old days. Margaret? I think it's a tricky question, um, because, if you want a role model, very often you don't want a real human being. Mm. You just want the profile or maybe even the caricature. You want all the good things instead of a full human being. Mm. Uh, I, for me, it has been uh, always a great inspiration to work with people of, uh, of my own age, to be part of a group and see how different characters and, and different talents come forward to make things work much more uh, comprehensively. Mm. And um, since in, in, in my own life, it has been very important that, uh, that politics and leadership is not a popularity contest. Mm. Uh, maybe on the contrary, it is, uh, it is trying to do what you think is right mm. and to, to do that with people whom you admire and respect. And, and therefore, I think it, it can be kind of tricky to have sort of two role models. Mm. But I find in a lot of people a behavior that I admire and that I take insp inspiration from. Mm. Uh, what Madeleine Albright uh, did uh, during the Balkan Wars, mm. I think was amazing. Mm. Because she took a responsibility out of out of sort of her own backyard. She reached out to Europe and personally engaged in enabling talks that eventually led to peace. Mm. And I think that that behavior is truly uh, inspirational. Mm. And then she may be everything uh, except for that, having fantastic sides and maybe more questionable sides, I don't know. Mm. Uh, but I think we owe our role models also to be full human beings. Fallible. Yes. Mm. <laughs> While we... Mentors. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're like, 
Don't ask me. <laughs> Mentors, mum, start with mum, come on. <laughs> my mother had a significant impact in my life. Mm. I do believe, however, that the diversity of the people that I've met in my journey have left different kinds of mm. impacts and thumbprints. Um, I've learned from them, young and old, those who are incredibly powerful and, and those who work uh, in the shadows but still work effectively. I, I also believe very much that you can derive inspiration from the least likely source sometimes if you are looking and mm. if you are aware, both self-aware but also aware of others and of the contribution that they make. Mm. So it, it's not so much um, somebody that I, I look to to emulate, but it's the many different qualities that I found that have given me strength and inspiration. Mm. In particular, resilience. This, this sheer determination to not just survive, but to just really thrive and to make good with the little that you have. And against all odds, against so many challenges, this, the power of the human spirit that can take over. You see that in an athlete, you see that in a refugee, you see mm. that in so many different types of mm. stories. And I think if I were to reflect at our own story here in the UAE, I think the leadership here have done something quite remarkable when they didn't have to, but because they believed in it, they took that course and they took a course that was harder than others mm. because of that sheer conviction and that principled belief. Mm. Fascinating. Um, I want to talk about how we might message on innovation um, sustainability to the benefit of women's society and the global economy because that's what these two days will be about and I, I, I thought I'd give you guys an opportunity to just provide some sort of message um, for the audience here as um, as so many people will go about listening to individual stories and and, and visiting the hubs um, but before I do that I just wanted to uh, get a sense from all of you about on a wider basis where we feel we are at present. Because as we look towards the challenges of providing a more sustainable future for all of us, we are looking in this region at a turning point perhaps in its evolution. In Europe, for sure, we have never been at a, a clearer watershed moment. Um, can I get your thoughts? Firstly, I'll take the Europeans and then I'll take those who are not European, <laughs> as opposed to trying to identify all of us. Emma, where is Europe? It, it is certainly at a turning point. Where does it go next? Where is it and where does it go next? Well, what, what I do hope and, uh, and I'm trying to push is to go forward. Mm. But unfortunately, all the, the signs, or many signs that I can see, is that we are going backward mm. in some way towards all the nation states. That, uh, that have been the source of two wars, mm. two world wars, by the way, plus a genocide. Mm. So, you know, if you look at the past century uh, from a European point of view, there is very little to be proud of. What we can be proud of is how we, over, how we have been able to overcome this disaster and uh, recognize that no nation can stay on its own and that the, the, the economic interdependence can bring also a more peaceful. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's the first time in our history that we have such a long period, 60 years of peace. Europe has never had such a long mm -hmm. uh, period of peace like today. But as I said, I am afraid that for lack of leadership, lack of understanding, lack of, uh, of willing to risk, to risk, to take a risk. To be a leader is not to be a follower. Mm. It's not that you have to follow the mainstream. It's that you have the vision mm. also to, to, to mm. say, hey, careful. Mm? Um, I am afraid that, uh, that uh, Europe is going backward. Mm. And in so doing, we are not up to our moral values that we pretend to be. Look at the refugee and migrant crisis. We are not up to the possibility, even economic possibility, 
uh, uh, and we are not, uh, uh, um, let's say, a global actor. But for me, the most worrying thing is that on this path, we are losing our moral values mm. that we pretend to have. And that is the most challenging uh, issue to me, uh, exactly because, because we realize that uh, war, wars come from nationalism, uh, hate, uh, minority, uh, intolerance, extremism, and we have seen it. Mm -hmm. Our fathers have seen it. And now we seem to have forgotten all these lessons of history. So that's why I'm really worried as far as mm -hmm. Europe is concerned. Are you equally as worried? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it is, it is very striking to see the responsibility taken in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Turkey, for people who flee for their life. And then to, to see what is happening in Europe. Because it seems to be so challenging for us to stand up for very basic values of humanity. And in that, I think we are truly challenged. Um, Europe has been written with crisis now for almost a decade. And it also took quite a long time when the financial crisis came over and, and swept us away like a tsunami, uh, before there was a real sort of felt sense of urgency. Mm. It, it was a somewhat similar situation, everything else being different. Um, but then eventually, the European leaders stepped it up and realized that no matter how difficult it is, no matter how challenging it is, there is only one way, and that is to find the solutions together. Not my preferred solution, not yours, but what we can agree on in common. And, and I think that to find that sense of urgency, mm. uh, we have actually two sources. Because one of the still promising things is that um, now latest and, and very concretely, uh, the Commission, the Council, uh, the European Parliament managed to make a deal for uh, the Brits to have their referendum mm -hmm. in, a, in a quite uh, intense, mm -hmm. uh, constructive and concentrated way. Mm -hmm. The institutions are still strong <clears throat> and it is still, uh, it is still embodied in people who actually want to take upon them the competence and the power and the willingness uh, to do that. Uh, and I think one example which is also almost forgotten was the fact that we were actually successful in having a deal in Paris mm -hmm. in December mm -hmm. on a very strong European mandate mm -hmm. because the European countries has come together. And, and in that, I think we can find some of the powers to change because we are faced with very, very severe problems right mm -hmm. now. And it's fascinating to be watching the, the European project at its watershed moment, let me put it that way, through the prism of living in the Middle East and, 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 and understanding better what's going on here. It does seem remarkable. It's, it is interesting and I think important, Margaret, that you point out that, the, that you believe the institutions, the core of the European mm -hmm. project, the institutions are actually still strong. Um, it, it's, it's, as Emma points out, perhaps a, you know, a very scary idea, but the people's moral values, which are um, questionable at but present. You, but you see, just, I think it is quite thought-provoking that the most European leader right now is Angela Merkel. Mm. She is the strongest possible uh, leader, her leadership... Uh, under so much pressure, Under so much pressure, <laughs> but talking about turning points, mm. she has truly made it, both personally, but also for the country which she's in charge mm. of. And that kind of leadership, which is daring, and which shows the value that she's not only in her rhetorics, yeah. mm. but also on ground. Not without problems, not without mm. in tremendous challenging, challenges, but actually being there and standing up mm. for something. I think that could be a very concrete inspiration for every European. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Angela Merkel, of yes. course. Fantastic. Thank you. And she's a risk taker, um, which was what we talked about mm. earlier on. Um, yes. I wonder if you 
wanted to comment on, 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 on the European challenge, as it were, through your own prism, or whether you wanted to talk about the turning points that you see in the sort of immediate region that you are in, yes. and, and, and the challenges going forward. I think I'll just uh, uh, agree, well, I totally agree with what Emma and also what said, is that uh, there has been, I think, over the past uh, well, decade or so, and I think Emma mentioned 60 years, but I think fortunately for Europe, you've done away with war. But I think in terms of Africa, uh, in terms of our, our part of the world, there has been this, a lot of short-termism. Mm. Uh, the leadership has been kind of very centered around election, winning uh, you know, the next term. And if you look at the challenges of sustainability, we are really you know, looking really long term. And Reem has also mentioned the issue of terrorism. To me, the, the biggest challenge we face is the challenge of climate change. Mm. It's already biting in if you see a lot of the climate refugees, mm. climate migrants, we are seeing this is already happening. And if we look at a country where I come from, where if you look at the ranking in the World Risk Report, we are very high up in the World Risk Report. And if you look at, the, again, I'll, I'll make the case for small island states. And by the way, this is the forum that we are hosting in Mauritius on between the 20th, 20th and the 21st of June, addressing climate issues for Africa and for small island states. Mm -hmm. What are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about climate and health. We are going to talk about climate and energy, climate and agriculture, frugal innovations. I mean, all these themes are going to be directly relevant to the sustainability of humanity on this planet. And unfortunately, the leadership of date, we don't seem to embrace that enough. The, 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 the fierce urgency of now, as has been said all the time. And this is what to me is very worrying, that we don't see this cohesion, we don't see the interconnectedness uh, Amongst you know Europe, Africa, we all interconnected. Mm. We all interconnected in this in this whole entire planet, and yet we don't seem to have this global leadership to address this and to speak with one voice. Mm. We have seen an attempt in Paris to come up with this deal, which of course uh, some some of you will challenge that is not the best deal. But we had a deal, mm. and we have to say that it was the first time mm. there has been consensus. But we need to see again this global leadership across the world, coming together so as to save humanity against this impending disaster, which is climate change. And it is impacting lives, it will impact lives faster than we think. And uh, for scientists like ourselves, we need to reassess our appetite for risk and we need to go forward further into You're this. You're talking about being outward looking rather than inward looking. Yes. My worry and my fear is yes. that... You know, as, we're, yes. as, as Europe struggles, it becomes more inward looking and, and, and the sort of exactly. issues that you're talking about won't, won't, won't get addressed. Um, I wondered if anybody at this stage, because I know we've only got a few more minutes left and, and I've been kind of hogging these guests, so if anybody <laughs> has got any questions that they would like to pose, there are microphones doing the rounds. Anybody going to... I can't see behind me, so I'm going to just turn around like this. Anybody, anybody? Oh, yes, a couple of questions <laughs> over here. Thank you. It's an odd one to have to turn around. Microphones just towards the back there, hands up there. I'm just going to... I think I've got a couple of hands up over here as well. Yes. Keep them very tight, please, or clever questions. There you go. Thank you. Tight, Good morning, questions. and Good thank morning. you for this brilliant discussion. I'm Shelley Porgus. I'm from Washington, D.C., um, and I thank you for all your perspectives from this part of the world, and I wonder... Um, I'm a co-founder of Entrepreneurs for Hillary, among other things, and wonder what you see as the role of the United States and the next president. Excellent question. Thank you. Who'd like to take that one on first? Emma. I couldn't get... <laughs> no, no, that's okay. But I couldn't get the right. question. What, what do you see question? as the role of the next US president? Correct. What? Yes. <laughs> what do you... <laughs> The lady who asked the question was from Entrepreneurs for Hillary, as in I assume Hillary Clinton, am I right in saying that? <laughs> yes. Um, so the question was, what do you want to see as the role of the next US president? And there is clearly a female contender at this point. Well, first of all, I think that uh, uh, as, uh, it would be extremely important in any case, uh, not only that she is a woman, but that she is Hillary. Which is different. <laughs> mm. No, it's different. 
Uh, as I said, it's not enough to be a woman, etc., etc., etc. But she has proved. Well, I happened to meet her in well in the in the uh, former Yugoslavia war from mm. Sarajevo and etc. But I also think that that to run a country you need also some you need experience, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's there. You need endurance. You need character. You need. And I do believe that, as far as I understand and I know her, I, I really think uh, uh, also that it could, it, it's, it's a very important, mm. not only a symbol, but I think it's important in a, her way of dealing with, mm. with things and how to negotiate, how to be tough, even if I don't share everything on her policy, of course. But, but I think it could okay. be important. And I think the wider question was the role that the US president, the president of the United States of America should play in this global world going forward, because clearly things change. Margaret. Well, picking up on what you said about Europe and, and the risk and the tendency to turn inward, I think the biggest challenge is to uh, engage, engage with the rest of the world with uh, an Africa building up, being still stronger, playing a still more important uh, international role, Europe who's struggling, uh, all Asian countries coming together in a different way uh, to enable trade. We are negotiating right now trade agreements, uh, EU, uh, the US. Uh, last year, a very important trade agreement was made with the uh, Asian countries and the US to engage fully because we need this, I think, very comprehensive leadership for the world to come together. Mm. And for a, uh, an American president to do that, I think uh, that, is, uh, that would be an amazing contribution to the world. Engaging. Um, there are those who will say, given what is going on in Syria at the moment and the influence of the Russians and the Iranians, that the US has found itself under the auspices of the stewardship of John Kerry, rather irrelevant at present in certain Well, because discourse. people think that, that the only way to engage is militarily. Uh, it's even <laughs> too easy to go around and bombing here and there. We did it already. We were fully engaged mm -hmm. in disaster, by the way. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's get some... Slow down. Mm. Uh, maybe it's a longer. Uh, what is happening is unacceptable from humanitarian, from human being point of view. Mm. I strongly believe that uh, 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 till we don't reach an agreement between uh, Tehran, Ankara, Damascus, and Riyadh, there is very little that you can do from outside. If not adding disaster to disaster, we should. I wouldn't know what to bomb anymore. <laughs> Everything has already been bombed as far as I, I, I see uh, around. So, uh, uh, and even if it is a longer and painful, uh, the, the, I, I do believe that just coming and bombing and leaving, we did it already. We came and bombed and stayed in Iraq, mm. disaster. Mm. Uh, we came and, uh, and bombed and, w and left uh, in Libya, other disaster. Mm. So please, and also to call people to their own responsibility. Mm. Till these four capitals, this is mostly a regional fight and a regional war with some intervention mm. from outside. But basically is a intra-Sunni, intra-Muslim war. So we have, I think, also to ask Tehran, Riyadh, Ankara, uh, uh, and Damascus to stand up to their own responsibility. Yes. And it's not bombing from the outside that is solving the issue. It's an intra-Muslim fight, mostly. Yes. mostly. Becky, we yes. know what yeah. it is. Yeah. We the, had a yes. 30 years war, yes. so-called religion war, mm -hmm. and etc. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah. responsibilities have to be shared. Yeah. You, you just mentioned the importance, and the question was part of uh, the, 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 the view of what the president should be doing. Now, I'll be quite controversial. In view of the fact that the United States has such a big influence on the world, if you look at the currency, how it is important across the world, why shouldn't the world be voting as well? Hmm. 
Why should the world be voting? Why shouldn't the world get a vote? <laughs> It's not a bad point. We should. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because they have such a big influence. You mentioned in Africa, you mentioned the Middle East. So I think we should also have a voice. <laughs> <laughs> Very good point. Any other questions uh, from the floor? Thank you for your question. It was an excellent one. Yes, two or three questions here. Should we take each of those questions? So rather than one at a time, one, two, three. Hands up, ladies, once again, three. Excellent. Should we just... One question from you, please, and then we'll just box them all off and we can answer them. There you go. There you go. Excellent. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Khawla Luta. I'm a board member of the Dubai Business Women Council. I just have some uh, additional remarks to what Her Excellency Reem have said about women in the Middle East in general and the UAE in particular that women all over the globe did not mushroom out of nothing. Obviously, they are pa part and parcel of the circumstances and, and the conditions that they live in. Historically speaking, we had very strong women, uh, women who have been left behind when men has to strive to go to the sea and, and work for the, the livelihood of the family. So women basically have to acquire the inner strength to be able to, to live the dual uh, challenges, which is a mother and a house and a breadwinner mm. for the, the longest period of six months. Uh, historically speaking, even in Islam, uh, we had very strong role models. Take as Sayyida Khadija, uh, the prophet's wife, who traded and who commissioned him, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to trade for her. Mm. We have a Sayyida Aisha who has sat in public uh, audience, within public audiences to recite poetry and, and see the trades in Suq Uqab, for instance. So basically, it's, it's, it's the, the, the women within the women that we should look at. Thank you. Thank you. Very good point, thank you. Please pass the microphone along. Hello, my name is Munal Haimoud. Um, I would like just to ask why we don't have enough women leaders in the world. For instance, till now we don't have a female UN Secretary General. And the elections now we have only four candidates and it looks like a bit impossible. What's wrong with us? Why it's not happening? Thank you. And the UAE's ambassador to the UN isn't here today, but I, but I have no doubt that she could easily run that place single-handedly. <laughs> um, Reem. I underscore, Becky, your uh, comment on our ambassador in, uh, in New York. Lana is, is a remarkable tour de force. I think that it's, that it's coming, that it started in many ways in many countries. One could argue as well that not only as SG of the United Nations, but then also in many other um, political landscapes, the role of women is not as, as prominent. And I believe that the tide is slowly turning. I think that it will not turn easily and it will need constant and consistent, um, persevered, um, reaching out. Mm. I think the president in her own professional journey can also attest mm. to it not being an easy thing. And, and the more you have forums like this, the more people can say, I've done it, mm. I've managed my home life, my personal life, my public life, and I've it wasn't made it. Easy. It wasn't <laughs> easy, but you know what? Yeah. I did it anyways, mm. and I did well. And so I can, you can inspire that it is not so impossible and mm. that people can then walk into this knowing that others have done it too mm. and, and it can open up for me. Mm -hmm. But you have, of course, a deeply entrenched bureaucracy that favors a particular elitist group and that's just the way the world is. Mm -hmm. And we have to, men and women, this is not just a women's club, this is a group of people who believe in particular ideals. I'm so happy to see so many men in the mm. audience. And, and without men, as our partners, we're not going to be able to push the needle on this agenda. It's not about us patting each other on the back mm. and saying how great we are. It's, it's about us collectively working towards the better development of our community, of our country, of our region, etc. So, I, I think that, yeah. I, and I think we have at least one, I believe, 
one or two potential contenders as SG. I don't know if they've publicly made that th mm. those names, but at least that's what mm, I've been yes. hearing in multiple in multilateral mm. fora. So, so there, there you is, may be surprised. I think there, is what there, we're is, there is yeah. there is a chance actually. There is mm. there is quite a good chance. Yes. Yes. No, I think I think you're right in, in the sense that. It, we don't live in the moon, and that uh, and that women and men have to um, talk nothing against men. Let's say, simply uh, they are not normally very willing to share power, hmm? um, which is normal. Hmm. Power is a sort of an addiction. This is this is your this has been your your uh, experience in Italy because I'm not sure that that's necessarily true in no, other it's places. It's not a question of being in Italy. It's a question <laughs> of being everywhere. <laughs> Uh, more or less, um, and the fact that uh, the, the the question is why do we have so few women in, in power? Mm. Uh, mm. Well, because power is a fascinating thing, it's an addiction, and is uh, mostly occupied by men mm. who are not very willing to re well to go playing golf and live in U.S. space. Mm. So you have to, one way or another, make your own way and push them gently or less gently. Um, <laughs> to, uh, if you want that seat and that seat is occupied by a man who doesn't want to leave, you have to find a way of gently <laughs> or not gently to push him uh, out. <laughs> Otherwise, on his own, he will never go. Uh, uh, so that, that's... It goes with elections, it goes with networking, it goes with many other tools. Mm. Mostly it goes also from a woman point of view saying, I am able to do it, I stand up, yes. I will be a candidate, uh, uh, and I'm here. Yes. And with that, yes. And women not always, not always have such a courage. Yes. I was going to ask you, where do you get your elbows sharpened? Uh -huh. no. <laughs> ah, well, because... <laughs> and, 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 and if you've got, a, if you've got a great place, I'm sure yeah. many of the women here would love, love to hear. Listen, that, we have literally run out of time. I hope everybody has enjoyed what has been this opening session. I'm delighted to have the four of you on this panel. It's been fantastic. Thank you. And I do wish all of you, as I'm sure we do here, the very best in what will be a fantastic two days here in, uh, in Dubai. So very, the very best and good luck. Thank you.